uh, the 3D Potter machine. Now here the base moves uh, in the XY direction and the print head just in the Z. The result is you can carry a heavy weight of clay, but whatever you're printing is moving around. And um, the sort of forms I make, I don't think I could print on a moving base. Uh, Tom Lauman has taken the same principle, um, but uh, also this machine doesn't have an on-off. It's a continuous flow. I mean, the plunger or ram can stop, but there's always a bit of ooze, whereas Tom has put um, a, uh, a stop-start Auga screw into his machine as well. So this machine then is op an open source, um, available for, you know, through Tom's website. Uh, and talking with Tom, you know, there's a lot of metal in here. We both, from the you know, experience we've had of building machines, is plastic parts just are not strong enough. Um, you know, when building machines, you really need to build as strongly as you can. A lot of pressure is involved. Um, so this was, you know, what I thought or I hope would be the, the solution, a sort of 250 euro plastic machine, and then you somehow put on a ceramic print head. Um, this is my own self-built. And a print like this can work with an air system or a RAM system equally well. Uh, so the print heads, now on my website, I have uh, well, I published a PDF, you know, guide to ceramic 3D printing. All of this information is, is in that guide, and that is, you know, how to build your own print head. So, um, you know, it wires into the system that plastic printers use, and it really is just a screw that then controls the clay that has been fed into there in a range of, of um, uh, nozzles. This is a big wasp print head. So this is from the new big machine, and uh, this is actually the Sarambot print head, um, but is a, unfortunately, a very close copy of the original Wasp print head. Uh, and again, you can just see a simple screw. And personally, I find these print heads quite adequate. You know, I'm aware of developments in using um, the cavity type print heads, but I, I really don't think the extra technology is required. Um, so feeding clay, as I say, that was the print head, and then feeding clay, you can feed clay, you know, on a small scale, and I find this really useful for doing small, you know, jobs of work, or when I'm testing, is that this would then just be plugged into the print head, and that's an air system, or I have developed, you know, small motorized RAM type systems. Um, now, you know, for the print result, there is no difference as to whether you're using air or RAM. I personally prefer air because it is just so much simpler. I can imagine people who are more sort of engineering tech minded might prefer the idea of RAMing, um, but I'm always just really concerned that something is going to break. So this is then a slightly larger feed, you know, the last, sorry, go back. So this is you know, 250 to 450 milliliters. But, you know, that's enough to make something about 15 centimeter cubic. Um, but if you're getting bigger than that, obviously you need a bigger clay container. 2.6 liters in this RAM system, three liters in this RAM system. So an air system is that, whereas a RAM system is all that and the drive is required to, to move the RAM. This, this RAM is controlled by a button. It isn't built into the, um, the controller of the 3D printer, whereas this RAM is built into the controller of the, three, of, you know, of the 3D printer. Um, a homemade system, actually, the, the container wasn't, I bought that, um, but, you know, I, I've taken this photograph to represent you know, that it's not a complicated bit of equipment to make. I've already been through the print head. 
intuitively, you'd always think that some sort of funnel shape as the clay goes from a large shape down to a small, you know, tube is, is a good idea. Um, but I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, this was clay container made um, by the folk in Reykjavik. Um, and I have documented all of this. Um, obviously, one thing one has to be, you know, for safety matters is make sure that you've got, uh, this is an air valve set for eight bars, that you not, you will never be pressurizing one of these too highly. I mean, touch wood in the 10 years of printing, um, I haven't known of anything to go wrong. Um, these, I'm now getting into some tests that I've done. Um, this is looking at how clay actually extrudes out of a container. So it's gray clay. I've then taken some food coloring and I've put in a line of green clay, some gray clay, and then the blue clay and the gray clay, and then pressurized it. So to begin with, these lines were straight, pressurized it to see how the clay has gone down the tubes. And here you can see really interesting how well defined the difference is between the green and the gray. And that will go all the way until the screw. And I guess the screw would then actually mix it up. But uh, it helps explain why if you're using different colored clays in the clay container, that you always sort of get a striated effect rather than a, you know, sort of very clear definition between the two. Very interesting. Uh, and also then helps explain why, as I say, intuitively, you would think that um, a conical shape would be good on an exit. But I actually used to find that if I left this printer overnight, when I came to get going again the next day, it would often be blocked in this area. And that is because, it, you know, it's a well-known fact that if you pressurize clay, then the water starts getting driven off. So what I've tried to illustrate here is how the clay is being compacted against the clay container. Obviously, this is the plunger, and be this mechanically round or pressurized, you are then getting dewatering um, around the edge of the container. And um, so people then said, oh, you know, because it's not uncommon that if you say pressurize a container for three days, that the clay in the container has got much harder than when you started. Sometimes there's a bit of water dripping off, but where has that water gone? On the whole, I'm suggesting that the water actually gets almost like in a sponge, it gets forced towards the middle. And then the softer clay, as you can see here, is going down and through the outlet. Whereas here, it's been compacted overnight. This sucks water out of here. So then this clay here starts getting harder and you get a blockage. So it's actually better to have the pipe just feed straight out of a larger clay container. Uh, mixing by clay, uh, mixing clay, um, I don't have, you know, a, uh, um, a clay mixer and uh, I get through a lot of clay and I do it just like this. And so that's with a wire. I cut through the block of clay and take a fork, fork it through, add water, fork it through, get in with my fingers and just start mixing, mixing, mixing. And here you can see I'm using the tips of my, my fingers so that I can really, I'm feeling for any lumps. And I will scrape it through and slap it onto the other pile and then scrape it through and slap it back. And this um, sequence of sort of scraping, slapping, scraping, slapping, you can see how I've demonstrated here, just feeling it on the tips of my fingers to make sure that it's, it's really even consistency. Right, so um, uh, I must get through this quite quickly. Uh, and again, all this is documented in um, that uh, guide to ceramic 3D printing I was talking about. Also the community on Wikifactory that we have, I have it all documented on there as well. Um, but uh, earlier in the year during lockdown, it was a good opportunity to try and answer a lot of those questions that I get asked in workshops. And that is, you know, kind of why does this happen? Why does that, and so on and so forth. Um, so here I have tested six clays, testing six clays, and uh, china clay, porcelain, a ball clay, stoneware clay, 
uh, and a coarse stone wick clay, so bigger particles than that, and then a red clay. Um, and so you can see there's almost a kind of a color thing going on here. But also, if you know your clays, what one is then talking about is this is a primary clay, and we know primary clays, the actual particle size is larger than secondary clays and your finest, sec finest secondary clays are red clays. Now, this is actually a brick clay. Where I am in East Anglia, you know, is, is well known for brick making, but is actually very sandy clay. Um, and uh, this first graph here is representing the amount, what I've done is take um, some clay, mix it up to the consistency that I think would be printable, and then I've dried it out, at, well, weighed it as wet clay, and then dried it out as dry clay, and so I can work out how much water there is and how much dry clay there is. And what I want to illustrate here is that you can see immediately that there isn't a simple solution as to how much water you should put with how much clay, because different clays have different amounts of water. So then what I wanted to do was actually look at this problem of clay going down a tube. Now, if you have something like a little machine um, or the 3D potter machine, the American version, the clay container is very close to the printhead, so there's not such a problem. But if you're trying to feed from a large clay container to the printhead, as in the wasp machines, then you have a problem of forcing the clay down a pipe. And so what I've done here is I've mixed all my clays to the same consistency, and um, I've my measurement is this drop spike, and I'll show you in a moment. But basically, I mix up the clay, and then I drop the spike into it and measure how far the spike has dropped in, and then that can give me a definite reading. So all of these, the spike drops in by 2.9 millimeters, or centimeters, 29 millimeters. So I know that all my consistency is the same. I then try printing with them, and I can see how much pressure I'm needing to print with. And you can see the porcelain only needs three bars of, of pressure to print, whereas the red clay is already right up here at 5.4 bar. Now, you know, this is kind of predictable, um, but we can keep going with that. This is the drop spike, and again, it's documented in um, that document I said, but the principle is to drop a spike um, by 10 centimeter, and the spike has a 60 degree angle to it. So this is the um, the, mark, the, the uh, kind of spacer. You lift this mark until it is there, in which case then the spike is sitting about 10 centimeters up, and it drops 10 centimeters into the clay, and then you measure the clay. Um, that seems to be kind of pretty consistent as a measuring device. So my next set of tests, what I did here, similar consistency of clay, but now what I did was to fill up a syringe with clay, put on, I think it's about a four millimeter nozzle, and then press, and, and put the nozzle into the syringe, and press it down on a scale, just to see how much force was required to get the clay to start coming out at the end here. Again, to see what, what the difference was and which clays kind of could be forced through the system better. And again, you can see the porcelain and the stoneware clay took the least amount of pressure and the more pure clays, the ball clay particularly being sticky and the red clay being sticky. Now, all these are the same consistency, but it's the character of the clay, the stickiness of the clay, the clay particle size, in fact, that is making it require more force to push it through. Clays with grog in them, this, this stoneware clay's got grog, or porcelain clay that is only 50% clay, the other 50% is feldspar and silica, move through the system, move through pipes so much easier. So this is, you know, confirming those measurements once again. What I've done here is mixed up all the clay to the same consistency, put it in a container, and then set the pressure to the same pressure and see how fast 
it will extrude out of the end of the tube. All right? So the pressure is constant, and this is the amount of clay that will extrude in 10 seconds. So here, the longer it is, the better it goes through the system, basically. And again, porcelain is going through well, whereas the sticky ball clay is going through less well. Now, these last two clays, the darker clays, ultimately the more sticky clays, actually wouldn't appear at the end of the pipe um, at three bar of pressure. So I had to turn the pressure up to four bar um, to be able to even get it to start coming up. And so you can see the red clay, only a small amount, what's that, one centimeter would come out over 10, cent, um, over 10 seconds at four bar. So that, that, you know, quite, if you need to know this knowledge, you can look at the graphs and realize, you know, kind of which clays will extrude best and so on and so forth. So my, my next set of tests were about shrinkage tests. So I had um, a, um, what are, were these? I think a four centimeter by four centimeter cylinder. And I would print that out in each one of the clays, all at the same consistency. And this first set of photographs is those clays bone dry. And immediately you can see how the ball clay has shrunk so much more than, say, the china clay. China clay porcelain, ball clay, stoneware, fine stoneware, coarse stoneware, red clay. So this is a bone dry photograph. Now, unfortunately, my photographs weren't perfectly done. So the comparison you've seen here is a bit hit and miss. You, you know, you, in, in other words, it's not all to scale. But the next line is all at biscuits at 1,000 degrees. And you can see how actually things are starting to move around that this isn't proportionally quite as different as it was earlier in. And then the final line down here is fired to stoneware, a low stoneware temperature, 1220 degrees. Um, and again, you know, I, this is a little bit predicted when I laid out my, or chose which clays. You can see how there is a definite pattern happening across here. How this, the coarsest clay with the most grog in it, shrinks the, the, um, the least, whereas China clay shrinks the most. But also what's very noticeable is that this height, when printed, is the same as the width. And you can see China clay back here has actually shrunk much more in the vertical than it has in the horizontal, whereas a clay with a lot of grog in it has actually proportionally sh um, shrunk very similarly in height and in width. So I put that in, into graph form. You won't be able to kind of get your head around this graph quickly, um, but hopefully visually you can just start to see the pattern. The blue is the original size of the shape and then done to proportion. One is horizontal, one is vertical uh, at the two different temperatures in each case. Um, but I think the next graph tells you a little bit more. So this is that shrinkage I've just been speaking about at 1,000 degrees and at 1220 degrees, low stoneware. Um, and as I say, really interesting here that clays with a lot of grog in it, in their vertical and horizontal shrinkage, have stayed very similarly. But something like China clay, that is obviously just pure clay, quite a big particle clay, its vertical shrinkage is much, much greater than its horizontal shrinkage. Now, you know, how good my measurements were in these and so on and so forth, there's got to be a little bit of, you know, sort of doubt. Um, but, I, I, you know, the, the essence is certainly there, that clay shrinks more in the vertical than it does in the horizontal with extrusion printing. Um, right, I trust you're holding in there, all right. Um, but, uh, you know, I just find, I, I personally found these um, these tests that I did really revealing. Um, and uh, so here I'm testing clay consistency. 
and I've taken mixed up a clay and admittedly I mixed it up from powder and powder clay is, you know, in ceramic um, uh, terms, what we call short, if it isn't given time to really for the water to get right down into the particles. So it never prints awfully well. Anyway, fresh clay mixed from powder never prints very well. But I mixed up a soft version, a medium version, and a hard um, version, and printed with them. Uh, and, I, you know, what the takeaway from this is that if you look very closely, as I've done here, zoomed in, that as the clay gets harder, the surface is starting to crack up. And so I think if you're trying to print complicated shapes, if this cracking is happening, then the form is going to break down all the more easily. So, you know, what it's pointing to is a preference for using softer clay that is more plastic and holds together. I think within this top photograph here, an interesting fact is that when printed, obviously these three tests were all the same height. They have now are bone dry. When I photographed them, were bone dry. So this is the same clay, but the difference in height already represents the difference of amount of water between you know, a hard mix of clay and a soft mix of clay. So this is illustrating how important it is that you, you, your mix of clay needs to be consistent, you know, and not have hard and soft areas to it. Um, so this set of tests is taking those the same three samples of clay, and I, you'll see more of the shape in a moment, tried printing with it. The soft just collapsed. Now it collapsed because on the back of this shape, there's a 45 degree angle. So, you know, it was a, a tricky shape to try and print, but it was to see soft clay will not print that tricky shape. Medium consistency clay printed okay. As the clay got harder, it didn't stand up any better than the soft clay or the medium clay. If anything, the stiffer clay actually cracked because of those little cracks in the surface already, cracked up more and started breaking up more than the medium. So, you know, what I'm trying to work out here is, is the advantage to working with hard clay or not? So having had difficulty to print this shape with that, that mix of clay, I then thought, well, I'm going to try some additives in that clay. So this left-hand column is the photographs that you've just seen. So medium consistency, no additives. Then through knowledge, there's the idea, you know, or having looked at those earlier tests and seeing how the surface is cracking up. And I think that even those little cracks, then, you know, as more clay gets built on top are likely to open up more. So you want a surface of clay that is as consistent and sort of uncracked as possible. And a small amount of sodium dis, um, sodium uh, dispex or a small amount of um, ah, the term has gone out of my head, but you know we're now getting very technical. Anyone in this area will understand it and as I say you know it's it's there. So it was basically trying to improve the surface of the clay and a tiny little bit of sodium dispex did help that. Now too much, and you're going to ruin the character of the clay, but a small amount anyway. So I then similarly thought, well, uh, some paper, is paper going to hold, hold it together more? A, a bit of improvement, but 1% of paper fiber in the clay, you can see it quite drastically changes the character of the clay, not much of an advantage. But the fourth edition, or third edition, sorry, fourth line, was, you know, for me, absolutely revealing is 5% of bentonite. Now, bentonite is a very plastic clay. It offers more malleability to the clay. Um, you don't want to be adding more than about 5% because it shrinks a lot. But the transformation of 5% bentonite, you know, was, was most revealing, I think. Um, but what it also does do is it just, it sort of tells us working with 3Ds, you know, 
uh, extrusion printing, that plasticity is important to the technique, that actually plastic clays print better than non-plastic clays. Non-plastic clays are often high in grog or kind of um, very large particle. Um, right, I'm really sort of just marching on here, sorry. Uh, a bunch of tests here, testing different size nozzles. So what I'm doing here is trying to look at nozzle to layer height. This is a three millimeter nozzle, a two millimeter nozzle, 1.6 and a one millimeter nozzle at the back and quite a large slice height here, probably one millimeter and the slice height is decreasing to the right. Uh, and then I benchmarked it. So this is my normal printing technique of using two layers with a small nozzle and about a 1.6 millimeter slice height. And I just wanted to prove to myself that this shape with a 45 degree angle overhang and a textured area and a straight edge to it was printable. So then with my different nozzle heights, I was testing first for vertical edge so technically what I'm looking for here is that what's the quality of an edge of a printed piece? Now the logic here is that the larger the nozzle, you can see here we're talking about a three millimeter nozzle, an edge can only be as sharp as the size of the nozzle you're using. So if you want hard edges, you've got to be using a small nozzle. I mean, the logic is simple. And then it's a matter of getting what size slice height you want for that. So, you know, this is a three millimeter nozzle. Do you want to use a 1.5 millimeter layer height or a 0.6 layer height? You know, and these choices up to you, it's the quality that you're trying to look for. But the slice height, the main thing, didn't seem to affect the quality of that edge. You can see the edge remains constant. So then my low relief or textured, you can see that the texture, you know, here I'm now using a good quality clay that I use, that I know about, but my different nozzle sizes and looking at the quality of the texture and which would be the best choice of nozzle to layer, nozzle height, layer height, and which is the quality that I'd want to, to use. And the 45 degree overhang, again, Interestingly, you can see immediately that as soon as the ratio or the proportion of the layer height to the nozzle gets big, you start to get sagging. So you can start to make decisions as to kind of what solution, what resolution proportion you want, want to be making. So from all those tests, I have come up with a table and I uh, have an observation that in actual fact, the proportion of the nozzle, so the gray represents my nozzle here, and um, the terracotta is the clay, that the proportion between nozzle size and layer height changes as your nozzle actually gets bigger. And this is a little bit, you know, I say because of the spread. So along the top here, I've got nozzle heights, but actual fact that your extrusion width, the size of the extrusion is always a little bit bigger than the nozzle because it flattens out, you know, it extrudes further out. But proportionally on a small nozzle, it's not going to extrude out that much, but as the nozzle gets bigger, it gets bigger. Anyway, the takeaway from this here is that I believe that the ratio of the nozzle, where are we in the nozzle, to the layer height proportionally gets greater as you get bigger with the nozzles. So I, I tend to work with a 1.6 between one and two millimeter nozzle. And so you can see in the, in the one millimeter nozzle, my layer height to nozzle size will be about one to two. But as I get up to, to a two millimeter nozzle, it could well be up to one to four. Uh, and the logic of all this is that if you're building absolutely vertically, then stuff packs up, you know, the layers pack up on each other, no problem at all. But as soon as you start making curved forms, you have this problem of actually, if the layer height is great, 
then you don't get that sort of cantilevering or the overhang, the pieces sticking together well. Whereas if you, so this is a 45 degree angle that we try to print. If you've got a small layer height, then you've got more chance of actually sticking together than with a larger layer height. <clears throat> Obviously the nozzle size is exactly the same with both of those. And my solution is actually just for making complicated shapes is to build with two walls so that this sort of cantilevering then can support itself as we work. Um, so you can see here printing some teapots, you can see the two layers happening here. And this is, I think, using a 1.6 millimeter nozzle, making teapots all in one with the holes already in place, with the nozzle in place and the handle in place. And uh, although this could be printed independent from the body, the clay is soft, so I actually build, I will build in this little bit of support and then cut out the handle later on. Uh, speed tests and hard clay tests. Sorry, I'm getting there, I'm getting there. Um, but again, I, I just thought this was really revealing, and that is the question, oh, what, at what speed should you print? So my same sort of shape, same clay, same file, everything going on, I set it to 10, 10 millimetres per second, in which case a print took 42 minutes to do, and then, you know, all the same settings, and I did it at 40 millimeters per second. So the same print took 12 minutes to do, you know, and watching a print for 42 minutes or watching it for 12 minutes and the outcomes are exactly the same. You know, so here the takeaway is print at whatever speed you want. I don't think there is an optimal speed, you know, for good quality printing. Um, admittedly, the print head pulls the form around. So there, you know, there are other issues to get involved with, but print speed is up to you, what you're comfortable with. Uh, and then this point of hard, uh, hard, soft clay, you know, the logic is that a shape will stand up better if the clay is hard. Now, my observation is that the hard clay being extruded presses down on the layer underneath it by the same hardness. So if you've got soft clay coming out of the nozzle, it doesn't distort the shape underneath as much as hard clay would. And so I ran the tests. I did what was my normal printing consistency and did a test. And then I had what I would call hard printing clay. And then I mixed up what I would, and I have termed, I could throw with it on the pottery wheel, but it would be on the soft side of, of um, on the pottery wheel. And then, in fact, some clay that would be hard to throw with on the pottery, you know, is hard in consistency to throw on the pottery wheel. And this here, I had to use a ram, you know, air pressure wouldn't have got it through the system. So in actual fact, this was done with a ram where all of these were, were, were done with an air pressure. But, you know, the, the, the bottom line is, once again, there is not a great difference between using my normal consistency of clay or anything harder. And if anything, as the clay got harder, certainly on the 45 degree overhang, you can see it is slumping more. And more, what, what was more revealing was then this set of tests is where I took a 45 degree bowl. This first piece was was printed like I normally print, like those teapots were printed, a double edge, actually using a little bit of hot air to dry it while it's printing. What I did prove to myself was that the shape was perfectly printable. Then using only a single layer, so, you know, that's unfair in comparison, but a single layer of my hard printing clay, my soft throwing clay, my hard throwing clay, as the clay got stiffer, it was less, you know, less possible to print the shape. Um, just showing up how I work, you know, if forms have got an overhang, then I will just make supports and obviously we printing, 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 and then all of a sudden the print head will come out and be wanting to print over here. 
I've looked at my software and I know it's going to happen. So I have this handmade piece of support ready and I can just put it under and away it goes. Then the other thing I do a lot, so that in a way this is my solution to not having to use stiff clay. I use soft clay that makes sure that it sticks together well and it has a good surface quality to it. You know, but wants to deform, obviously. So I'll be putting in little bits of wire to hold it in place. And the bits of wire are just placed down and the printhead will come and just embed them in. So you can see I'm sort of supporting with wire. This is the heating system I use. It's just a, a, a little blower, something that is sort of used for space heating that normally gets plugged into the wall. But just a, a very soft um, direction of warm air as I'm printing. Um, inevitably, there's no way you can print, you know, logically you can't print flat um, shapes. I just let it do as best it can. And then I've got a syringe mixed with soft clay, a syringe sitting over here. I will then repair that by hand afterwards. And once it's stiff, just finish it off. Um, in that document I was talking about is a section on um, printing with very fine nozzles. Uh, you know, I think all I can say here really is, is I think the problem often with printing with small nozzles is the clay compacting. Compaction is a real killer. You know, people say, oh, it's blocking. And it's not blocking because of the size of the particles. Clay particles are very, very fine. You know, they're point two of a millimeter, 0.02 of a millimeter, they'll go through a small nozzle. What is happening is that you're using so much pressure that the water is getting forced out of the material and it's blocking under, you know, force of pressure. And then working at a larger scale is about just stiffening up the clay with heaters as it's printing. So finally, that's my last slide. So thanks very much.